Good morning, all. Uh, I'm going to speak to the objectives and expectations. Uh, the COO executive and transition is designed to support chief operating officers in these uncertain and challenging business times. Getting COOs in transition on your way to your next job opportunity is our mission. Open to COO forum members as well as any CO, chief operating officer or second command executives pro bono, absolutely no fee or obligation. The initiative is aligns with the chief operating officer business forum Inc. COO forum core values and is expressly intended for all chief operating officers and second in command executives. We are in our sixth month and we are continuing to uh, believe that we should be, will be staying in this for some time. And we're also looking at new wrinkles. We did uh, find a good one uh, when uh, Scott Bohannon has signed up for um, March 2nd. He's a president at Corn Ferry and he will join us in two weeks as the thought leader. Uh, in terms of uh, guidelines, just quickly here, uh, let's stay mute, muted uh, when, no, when you're not speaking because that will keep the, the noise down and the, and the dogs and things like that. Business first, uh, it's okay to be casual, go step away, get out for 10 minutes, whatever it takes. Uh, we're not here to hold you in your seat. Uh, business language, no politics, just works better. This meeting is recorded and we will post in the Mighty Network for later reference. And of course, all our meetings are. And if you're in the Mighty Networks, you know that you can retrieve anything from the very beginning of this. And that's, a, I think, a real asset of ours. Uh, and uh, we, will, we will have some Q&A at the end if, if there's time. Uh, I want to introduce the people who are putting this on for us. First off, Dan Jackson currently is serving as a fractional COO at two companies. Dan has over 25 years experience across the C-level and is an advisor director with VC backed pre-revenue startup public multi-office international organizations with over 400 million in sales. He has also served across the industry with experience in IT, services, tech, FinTech, clean tech, renewables, and wireless infrastructure support. He has been involved in over 100 M&A transactions, a number of restructurings, and over 30 capital raising transition transactions. Dan is a lawyer by training, but has successfully evolved to the business side where his legal expertise and experience provides that little extra in, in his decision making. Igor Pestelak is, uh, after successfully managing sales in Norvell and Cisco in emerging markets, Igor ran a $12 billion operational engine for Cisco in Europe and then transformed of their WW services sales ops. He's become known for reducing operational budgets while enabling rapid growth helping people understand where to focus. He captured his 20 years of strategic operations experience in two books, Simplified, How to Remotely Run and Transform Businesses, and a platform that he took to startups under the umbrella of ProfitCircles.com. We're also joined by uh, Laura Weichel and Fiona Murray, who are the champions of this, and I think most of you know them. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it along to uh, Igor, and let's get started, Igor. Take it away. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'm sharing my screen. It is great to be back um, with Dan. I must admit that back in September when we started with the first session, we were honored uh, to kick off this um, wonderful initiative designed by Bill, uh, Laura, and the whole team. And uh, our honor was to really take everyone through the uh, journey, which uh, the executive transition is, um, and build a roadmap for what will be coming from the whole group and a team of experienced COOs and second-in-command who were sharing their experiences in uh, many areas. 
What we'll do today, this is um, kind of our second tour of duty with Dan. We'll walk you through the same journey. So for those who were at the beginning with us, uh, it will be a recap for you and we'll dive into uh, remembering ourselves of some of the memorable um, meetings which we had over the last four months and their topics. And for those who are new, uh, you will uh, see a teaser uh, or roadmap for the journey, um, which uh, this team will go for the second time. Uh, I'll speak for about 15 minutes and then I hand over to uh, Dan. I'll be focusing more on the mechanics of the journey where Dan compliments, uh, compliments me with the uh, soft part, uh, the social part, the experience of people, kind of the part which is very exciting. So we split the transition journey into a three segments. Be heard, be seen, and be hired. The be heard journey is the first part, is about ourselves. Uh, to get to know each other and get ready to be heard. What do we need to do? Be seen is about how others perceive us in the preparation. Is it something which matches to how we think we are coming across? And really getting ready to go into the interviews and be hired. And the be hired is more about how we interpret the environment we want to go into to decide is it the right environment for us? Are we the right fit for the environment? So it is about planning the story. It is about a journey. Uh, there was 11, actually by now 18 sessions, uh, which we went through. It is a long process. And people ask me always, how long will it take? Um, I've heard from a friend of recruiter $400,000 salary, it takes up to 12 months and for every 10,000 on the top, add a month. So be patient and don't beat yourself too much. It is a really long journey. And it starts with our preferences. Um, preferences are changing during the life. Uh, what we wanted when we were in the 30s, 20s is different now. So do we know what they are? Um, should we review them? Um, do we want to go to very aggressive environment, or do we want to go through more nurturing environment? What is it? And there are two things which we are being judged upon and we should look at the IQ and EQ or the hard part or soft part or whatever terminology you want to have for it. The, the business mechanics, our skills experience or the dynamics, how we relate and interact with people. Things evolved as 10 years ago, we were uh, looking for a job, we look at the title and job description, and we were trying to fit our skills into it. That doesn't work anymore that way. Today, it's all about, or 70%, about the soft, the dynamics, the relation to the people. We are being hired for attitude more than for our skills. Skills are evolving so fast and demand for them that no one really cares do you have the skills? They do care about, will you learn it? Do you have the willingness to commit to lifelong learning? And so they hire you for attitude and a personal fit. When you are building the picture of <clears throat> that you wanna be heard, you need to be very concise. No one has the time for you. We need to be very clear and make sense, coherent. So there's a logic in our story. And obviously we need to be relevant. And the relevance is uh, uh, you know, something different for different companies we may apply to. So the relevant part needs to be very fluent and dynamic. Once we clarify who we are and what we want, which I would recommend to use one or another framework. There are so many frameworks out there. Just pick up the one you like, which resonates with you and built a very simple map, a spider map. What are your values? Um, you will see that most of the sessions which we held over the last six months started with the value, personal values, the values we are seeking in the companies, uh, which region we wanna work in, you know, what skill set we have, are we committed to the overall uh, lifelong learning? 
how much autonomy do we want to have? Do we want to go to a very autonomous environment where we are free to do what, uh, what we want as long as we deliver results? Or do we want to go to the structured environment? Which sector? Uh, changing sector is fine now. Uh, COOs um, are very broadly equipped with uh, uh, loads of skills because they are the dot connectors. So for us, it should be relatively easier to switch sectors because our knowledge is very generic and needed across sectors. Our experience, mastery, our style, our culture, meaning set of behaviors and norms according to which we behave, and the collaboration, uh, which is the one I started the attitude, are we willing, able, uh, and liked when we collaborate with people? So once you have that picture of yours, and um, you can step uh, to the be seen air, uh, arena. Well, what I wanna mention is here that my colleagues um, in session number two were talking about how to take that picture you built um, of yourself and build a personal brand. Why the personal brand is important? Well, as um, uh, Juan Montemoso and Kylan Adams and Paul Harris uh, spoke to us, it is a promise of value. No one knows what you've done, how good you are. You have to take it out there. So you have to build your personal brand. The personal brand is the promise of the value you will deliver. And I would highly recommend to, to listen to that session. Then in the session number four, Carol, uh, Carol uh, Kimmer and Margaret Ritchie with Tiffany uh, Grandchamp took it uh, to the next level, how to translate the personal branding and simplify it into a couple of very powerful statements in your LinkedIn profile. And uh, the three things to, the, you know, articulating the three things you wanna be known for, the three things which differentiate, differentiate you from the others. So once you have the personal brand and the promise of the value, then you just distill it down to the key words which are compatible with all the search engine and, and attractive on a LinkedIn. And in a session number 10, um, uh, they were introducing one of the methods, how you can identify yourself, uh, which is the Gallup Strength Finder. So again, if you are um, in... Um, uh, into the step number one, I would strongly recommend to review these phenomenal sessions um, of the speakers and the colleagues who really went deep down and gave us phenomenal um, insights uh, how to do this. So now when we are ready to, get, to be heard, we go out there and we start usually with uh, the second part of the journey with our friends. And with our friends, we have kind of one to 10 chance to, to land some type of conversation or interview. And that's the best place to start. We expand to our network, people we used to work with, people we know, people we know on LinkedIn. We, we are somehow associated who do vaguely or, or loosely remember us, or we have the brand built with them. And to land the conversation there, you know, the stats are about one to 100. So you need to reach out to about 100 people to have a one meaningful, you know, job related conversation. And then there is the third part, which I call the algorithm, which is all the social media and LinkedIn. And the odds there are going rapidly down, especially um, with the level of seniority most of us have. Um, algorithms, LinkedIn, the search job engines, they are very good for entry level uh, positions, not that great for us. And people ask me always, you know, why, why it's so hard to really land the proper opportunity, Igor? And when I was thinking about this, you know, um, at the stage where we are, the people who really know how good we are probably retired or are not any longer in a position to offer us that type of senior job. The people who we worked with and are in such a position probably may see us as a competition. So they don't want us to be close. And then if we are discussing a position with the younger generation, well, unfortunately they don't wanna have their parents around them. 
And so it is tough there, but be patient because there is a way. There is a competition and the competition um, says the same. They go through the same exercise. So how can we differentiate ourselves? There are four areas which we can take as our experience, our seniority, our adaptability and our compensation we can play with as the levers. And what I personally always say is don't take them as a disadvantage, but turn them as an advantage. Uh, if someone tells you that you are too experienced for the job, just reply, well, I'm not. I actually am very willing to coach and share my experience across the company. Put yourself into, into the position of a free coach doing um, uh, together with your, with, with your job you're applying for. Just spin it in a way that they will see that as a non-threatening value add. A non-threatening is or became for me a key word because people see uh, the experience and seniority very often as the threatening. So I figured out that we have to come um, up as a non-threatening entities who actually can add a value. So, now, when you reach out to your network and you are in a phase two of preparation to get the next job, um, you use your framework to identify who you think you are. And you got ready to be heard. You went out there and they heard you, they've seen you. And you ask your network how they perceive you. And you use the same framework. Um, they are usually very willing to do that. Uh, data comes back. And you see that not everything what you think you are and where your value is, um, you know, is the opinion of your network. So that gives you the opportunity to calibrate your picture, adjust your brand, uh, ask, why do you think you know, um, I like less autonomy than I believe in terms of environment I want to go for. Discuss this and build the blended picture, which is the one you should really go to the market. And then there is the third part, which um, uh, is to be hired. Now, before we go there, I've got a couple of uh, sessions to remind ourselves of uh, which fit into this topic. Um, we had a session number six with Jay Mitchell and Mark Myers, and they were talking about uh, the, the techniques of developing your network, how to do that. Um, if you've been in your job head down for many, many years, you have your network, but you may not be active. So very, very interesting session. I would recommend to replay it or attend it uh, in the future when uh, both of them will, will repeat it. And then uh, I was talking about the, the team player, the, uh, the, how you relate to a people. Um, so Percy Cannon um, had a phenomenal session, number eight, um, what makes ideal team player? Um, Patrick Lencioni is, is, is the framework uh, he's uh, often using. And I think that um, this is a really, really good session to, to listen to um, how to come uh, across as a non-threatening value-adding team player. And then uh, session number 13, uh, which was uh, Marsha Ballinger, uh, who was talking about the nine networking mistakes and uh, gave us a 20 minutes framework for really speed uh, productive networking. So all these sessions uh, really went deep into the techniques, how to build, use and leverage your network. So again, for those um, who are new to this um, uh, forum, I would recommend to replay or attend these sessions in the future. Then we continue to really fine tune the resume. So we know who we are, we know what the perception of us is, and um, we know how to network and how to build a network. So now we need to fine tune our resume and build it as a reflection of our values. So in a session number, number seven, uh, we have Ralph Young and uh, uh, the one and only Josh Reinecker, who is with us today on the phone, uh, who led us 
through uh, this journey. And then in uh, uh, session number nine, uh, Josh was uh, joined by Marvel Allen and they took the resume build up into the next step of how to prepare for interview. So the whole journey nicely con continued from the networking, avoiding the mistakes, leverage the network, fine tune the, uh, uh, your resume, and then start getting ready for the interview. What to say, what not to say. In a session number 15, then a very, very useful day for Farrell was talking how to nail and crash the video interview. Because today we don't talk live. We suddenly became the TV stars. This uh, for many of us is a really hard transition. Um, you know, commitment to life law, uh, lifelong learning. What does it mean? Well, in the six months, we became a screenwriters. We became uh, commercial producers. We became uh, actors and we became a TV anchors. And all that because we just can't walk out. And so, um, you know, we all learn all the time and we just mastered completely new skills, which we did not have before. So crushing the video interview, great tips of what to do and um, how to really make a lasting impression when we talk and ask for a job um, through video. Now be hired. So, we know who we are, we know how we are perceived, we are ready to get the opportunity and talk to the company. Now there will be loads of reach outs. As I said, um, one to 10 with the friends, one to 100 with our network, one to 1000, pretty impossible through the uh, uh, search engines. But one day there will be, and I think that I need to move, Okay, one day there will be a conversation. We will be fine, interesting to someone. Um, what this part is about is really about how we interpret the environment we apply to. And this, in my opinion, um, in a simple way consists of two things. Are we fitting or filling the job? So are we checking the marks that we can do the job? But more importantly, for both us and the hiring company, are we fitting the culture? Which is again, a set of norms and behaviors uh, according to organization functions. And here it's all about a chemistry, a culture collaboration and a competence. Uh, what I've learned that companies do not really want to hear about your past and about our past. We are so proud of. Um, so when you talk about yourself, I recommend spend about 30% of your time talking about your past. Just set the absolute minimum credibility you have to. But spend and focus the 70% of your time, how you take that knowledge and what you can do for the company. That obviously requires to do a lot of homework about them. Um, and a couple of our sessions over the last six months uh, were focusing on how to do the homework on the company, how to understand through the network, what their culture is like, what the challenges are like, uh, you know, where they are going, which industries, you know, how you can help. If you have that homework done, then the 70% of the time during the interview, you will be amazing them with how much you know what you can do for them. People are surprised when you understand their challenges. People are even more surprised when you suggest a solutions they did not think about. And so in that way, you can actually position yourself really, really well. Now, don't forget that there is the other side of it. You must not come as a threatening person if you walk through the interview with all the solutions and they are right you may threaten the hiring manager uh, because he or she didn't figure it out until now. So never forget about the non-threatening environment. Um, the culture, find out, uh, will you fit? 
we were talking about is uh, on the chart, you know, uh, do you want to have autonomous environment, less autonomous, how they collaborate, how they communicate, um, and how the organization is set to learn. Uh, will you get the benefit to learn or uh, do they expect that you do it um, yourself and so on? So, um, you know, this is the canvas uh, which we laid out um, on September 22nd. Um, you now end up with a third overlay of your chart. Um, you know who you think you are, you calibrate it to how others uh, see you. And now you overlay it with what the company expects and how the environments, what, what their environment value. And you can judge, is that the place I want to go to? And they will judge, is or are you a person they want to get? And so on that uh, front, I would recommend uh, session number three, which uh, talked about uh, the sea uh, level strategy. Uh, this was Catherine King and uh, Paul Harirat. Um, they uh, really uh, went down into four things, how you will be judged to be suitable for the job on, a, on the level of a trust. Um, are you coming across trustworthy? Your credibility, your skills and your expertise. And then session number 11, that was a very interesting one, um, which uh, was led by um, uh, Mark Myers and uh, Carlton Davis, uh, who was sharing with us his experiences of um, how he's been hired and his 18 month long journey to land a job he loves and he is waking up uh, to go for smiling every day. And so this was a heroic journey, a tough one, but ended up with a very, very positive outcome for both the company and, uh, uh, and Carlton. Um, so, the last session I would recommend, which kind of closed the first round of, um, of the interviews um, and uh, sharing experience, was session number 16, uh, led by um, our CEO, Bill Shepard, um, who had a panel of experienced COOs, and they were sharing the practices, the best practices, and a focus, what CEOs should uh, and should not do and what they should and should not focus on. So this was the journey. This is the blueprint we laid out um, back in September. Um, these are the sessions we walked through over the last four or five months. And um, this is the recap for those who went on us with the journey. And this is a teaser roadmap for those who are joining or join during um, the journey and wants to continue. Uh, people always ask me, okay, Igor, so I've done all of it. I didn't land any interview. I didn't land a job. Um, so if you are so smart, give me advice now. Well, here's what I've learned through my own journey. I was living in the six countries. I'm originally from Europe. Um, moving around without any intention, the job takes me from one country to another. I figure out that it is only 20% what I can control. 80% of my destiny was always controlled by other people. I had no control over it. Uh, however, the 20% I have control of, I was always striving to be ready and to take the right action or decision when the 80% of people controlling my life will do something uh, which I have a choice of. Um, the other thing which helped me a lot was Jordan Peterson. Uh, he's a scholar and, um, and uh, well-famous Canadian um, uh, lecturer and um, evangelist of lifestyle. He wrote a phenomenal book uh, called, uh, I think, a 12 uh, Rules for Life. But the one takeaway I took from him was, he's saying, life is not supposed to be easy. Life is supposed to be meaningful. Now, that may sound pretty odd, but I figured out when I uh, dig into it, you know, meaningful is never easy. And so as long as you keep your life meaningful, 
um, you get the energy and a motivation to continue with the whole process. Um, and if you didn't land the opportunity, you will just keep on it. Um, calculate your risks. Um, there needs to be pragmatic uh, element in the journey as well, because it's only you who know how long the, the search journey can be and how you have to adjust your requirements or desires. Uh, the, uh, you know, the runway has um, kind of end for each of us. Uh, so be flexible. Um, you know, you are not going to be judged uh, based on your job title. You are going to enjoy your life based on did you find the meaning? And uh, it is amazing how meaning can be found in a places we never expected them. And the last, before I uh, hand over to Dan, uh, people ask me, um, so when the market will recover, are we going into uh, the roaring 20s again? Uh, well, I'm not smart enough for that, but I came across a phenomenal podcast from Berkeley, uh, which I'll share with Laura. Um, and uh, in a nutshell, they say services economy is always recovering 40% slower because it follows the product economy. There needs to be a built a demand. So it will be slower than we wish, wish for, but it will happen. Um, oh. And the reason for that is that the economy is now 60% services in the US compared to 40% services when it was in the 50s. So this is my closing remark. I clearing up the slide for them and then take it away from here. Gosh, Igor, thank you. That was great. It was even better than the last time. And thank you. I had you, a four Bill. months to practice. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and thank you, Bill, for once again inviting me to present on this topic today. Um, as Igor mentioned, I will share some of my personal experiences and some practical advice on how to navigate through the process. And we've left the slide on the screen, as I think the steps represent well the path uh, that you need to follow or at least focus on. I also want to apologize uh, to those of you who listened to me present the last time we did the session, as some of what I will say today is similar. But before I go any further, I do want to remind all of you, and I think this is really important, and especially for those of you who are transitioning for the first time, that without question, you are all successful. You've gotten this far, you've had great jobs, and if this is your first transition, it can seem somewhat daunting to find another executive position. But I do want everyone to know that with focus and hard work and paying attention, you know, the series is great. You will land your next position and will continue down the career path that is right for you. One thing I've learned since I graduated law school 30 years ago is that careers are long and with relatively few exceptions are littered with bumps and obstacles. So as you look at the, the screen and you look at the slide on it, it's not quite as simple as following steps one, two, and three. You know, the edges get a little bit blurry, issues cross over and blend, but with that said, let's go. Let's start talking. Step one, be heard. I think Igor really hit it on the head when he, when he talks about knowing yourself, right? And in terms of your self-assessment, truly be honest with yourself. We all know what it's like to puff a bit when describing our accomplishments. We've been exposed to or work closely with a team doing X or Y. So we think we can handle a group actually does X and Y. And to be honest, this is mostly fine. But the thing I want to leave you with today is that as you look at your background and what you can and want to do, you know, the phrase focus is your friend comes to mind. And that's a great place to start. And, and I don't want to be contrary to what Igor mentioned about soft skills versus hard skills and being able to cross over industries. All that is true. But some of the issues are important. And what, what I'm trying to do today is, is is help guide you through the process in a more simple way that allows you to continue down the path of finding your next opportunity. So to bring that to something more tangible, I'm a lawyer by training. I have an undergraduate major in finance and I began my professional career 
at a large New York law firm as an M&A and securities attorney. Some years ago, I was asked to step into a CFO role at a public company, which I did. I was, had done lots of uh, corporate transactions. I had a finance degree. I felt like I could handle the role, mostly because the company had a solid controller. And I felt comfortable that with him handling all of the real corporate accounting duties, I could handle the rest. And so while I feel like I have the strategic ability and experience to manage a finance team, my accounting skills are truly lacking. So since that time, though, I've served as both the chief financial and operating officer of public and private companies. And I'm often contacted about CFO positions. But given my experience and knowledge of my own capabilities, if I'm contacted about a role, and in my assessment of that role, it requires someone with more developed accounting skills, I have to be honest with myself and with the company that this isn't a role I can do effectively for them, and that the process should end there, and that you know I have to make that decision and assessment no matter how badly I need or want the gig. Next, be seen. I would say that this aspect of my personal transition efforts live and die here. I would venture to say that 100% of my opportunities, and I think that this really goes to Igor's point about relying on the algorithm and hoping for success, come from friends and my network. Now that doesn't mean I haven't networked to recruiters or the board of directors or investors in a company I'm targeting, and I'm sure that you will learn over the course of the series that this is advisable, but that it's more likely someone who knows you personally or has, uh, is part of your network that connects you that will be the link to your next opportunity. The greatest challenge in this step is making use of your network in a way that both makes it easy for them to help, but also supports your goals. You know, as Igor again mentioned, your friends or you know, there's a great opportunity for your friends to help you find your next opportunity. And they will, they'll help you once you let them know and ask them for help. They know you, they respect you, and I'm confident will be there for you. The issue though, that's more challenging is how to utilize and make it easy for your network to help. To that end, my former brother-in-law who was a senior marketing exec for tech companies used to say that there are two aspects of your personal brand. And no, I'm, I'm not an expert in branding. And as Igor laid out, there'll be great experts later on in the series. But there is a distinction here uh, worth noting that I'd like to bring out and discuss with you today. The first is how people think of you who know you. For example, when you attend a COO forum meeting with people you haven't seen in a while, do they think, oh, hey, I'm glad Dan's here today. He's a thoughtful executive. I like his approach and perspective. I mean, that's great. I mean, it's, it makes you feel good and it's nice to be thought of highly. But when in transition, the more important aspect is the second piece. And that is whether these same people and others in your network think of you when an opportunity crosses their desk that would be a good fit for you. I just did this myself the other day. I saw an opportunity where I knew the recruiter well and sent it to a friend who I thought might be interested. I didn't know if this person was actively looking, but I still thought it was worth sending to them. This is another area where the concept of focus is your friend can help. Think about how you describe yourself in networking meetings. Think about the types of positions that would be a solid fit for you. And practice articulating these thoughts so when you are introducing yourself or describing what you are looking for, that person can help. If you attend a meeting where you get to introduce yourself, pay attention to the faces in the room. If you don't feel understood, change it up the next time. Keep working at it until it comes out smoothly, confidently, and in a way that allows the listener to get a feel for who you are. And when describing the type of role you are looking for, especially when speaking with someone in your network, be as clear and simple as possible. 
I'm looking for a finance or operating role in a 50 to $100 million company in the fintech space. Make it easy for someone who doesn't know you as well to connect the dots more easily to you. And if you've seen from Igor's presentation, the odds of your network helping is already 100 to 1. So being a clear networker with clear goals and a clear articulation of who you are is how you improve on those odds. So short of an opportunity falling into the lap of a friend who thinks of you and you land the role the next day, of course, use your network to get introductions to recruiters, executives, boards of directors, VC and PE firms, whatever you can do to get in front of decision makers. But again, make it easy for them to help. I remember the first time I asked Bill Shepard to make an introduction for me a few years ago. He looked at me and said, Dan, I feel like I know you well enough to make an introduction, but you need to help me. Please send me a note requesting the introduction and in it, please tell me a little about yourself and why an introduction makes sense. Make it easy. So all I have to do is forward it onto the person and say, I'd like to introduce you to Dan Jackson. I think it would be worth talking to. I think he would be worth talking to and I'll leave it to you guys to take the next steps, et cetera. In short, make it easy on your network to help you. Lastly, to this point, stay in touch with your network going forward. And as Igor described, that is one of the sessions was how to build your network and, and stay in and, and create a strong network. Um, that's really important. The last thing you want to hear during this effort is, oh gosh, I wish you'd contacted me last month. The perfect, the perfect thing for you crossed my desk. It's a little less relevant today because you are already in transition, but it really helps to have a strong network so you can be ready for the next time. Okay, be hired. As I mentioned earlier, most people are okay with a little puffing around your experience. We are all hardworking, thoughtful, and intelligent leaders who can handle almost anything that comes up in our day to day, even something we haven't done before. But do be wary about putting yourself out there in an area where you have no experience and that something is a significant component of the position you're interviewing for. And while I have not put myself into that kind of situation, I can share that when this has happened to people I have hired, things have not gone well and more often than not ended quickly and poorly for that person. There is no worse question in a future interview than why were you at XYZ company or an XYZ role for such a short period of time? Be honest with yourself and make sure that you can handle the role. And being open and honest can also have its benefits. A few years ago, I was introduced to the CEO of a company in the clean tech space. After meeting with him, it became clear to me that the skill set they needed was that of a startup accountant. Someone who could also act as controller in addition to that of strategic CFO. I was offered the role, but turned it down because I didn't think I could be effective. I really was afraid that I would not be able to effectively set up and manage the books and records of the company and would not su succeed in the role. Two or so years later, I got a call from the same CEO. He said that he had brought in someone who could handle all those core accounting tasks and wanted to know if I could join the company. I did join a CFO and quickly became the COO and stayed on a few years. I also want to address one of the key messages from Igor that culture and chemistry, in short, they have to like you and want to work with you, are critical in determining whether the job you'll be able to proceed in the opportunity. So when meeting with decision makers, finally, after all that network, remember to blend your stories. Don't just focus on analytics. Oh, I improve performance by X or Y percent but make sure that you have discussion points about how you work closely with the team, you coach the team, you improve the attitude, you help, you got involved in evolving the culture of the company and be sure to let them know how you will bring all of those great soft skills forward. Your clarity with your network got you to this point, 
but you need now to bring in that 70% of the soft, the soft skills that Igor discussed and described earlier to win the role. So in closing, there are three things I'd like for you to take from today's talk. Be positive, be patient, and be open. Be positive. This is a little silly, and people sometimes make fun of me for it, but I'm always telling people to smile. Even if you're delivering bad news, think about it. Be happy. Smile when you talk to people. Smile when you go to meetings. Smile when you're on a Zoom call. And to Igor's point about culture driving the decision, that positivity will resonate well. And that's the kind of person people want in their organization. They want happy people. No one wants to work with a buzzkill. Be patient. Notwithstanding the long period of time that Igor laid out, and you know, just listening to him talk about 12 months for the first 100,000 and another month for each 10,000 more, I know now that if I'm ever going to transition again, I will never find a job for the rest of my life. <laughs> it really is somewhat daunting, but be patient. If you are in transition, you have one thing on your mind, one. You have one priority. It's in front of you all day long. And depending on your level of savings, it's wearing on you and even your, you and your family. Yet the people you are asking for help, whether it be your network or someone you've already interviewed with, this might not be their first priority. There might be 10 things on their list of activities that need to be handled. So be patient. Just because you haven't heard back does not mean there is a negative implication towards you. Just realize that their priorities and your priorities might be different. Give them some time, those you can trust, and that know you will get back to you and will help you. Be open. The first thing you did right was to sign up for this series. There will be great experts in future sessions presenting on a wide range of topics, excuse me, topics all of which will truly help you in this process. Use your network and don't be afraid or embarrassed to ask for help. We have all relied on others throughout our lives, whether it be personal, with partners, friends, or family, or professional, people senior and junior to you, and other professional constituencies you interact with. They have all helped you get where you are today. None of us have been able to do this alone. So be open. Don't be afraid and don't be embarrassed. Get out there and ask for help and you will be successful at this next step in your life and career. And with that, I want to thank Bill for allowing me to join and we will open it up for Q&A. Um, so if, uh, thank you for taking the slide down. If anyone would like to raise their hand, um, Let's see, it's, I'm trying, I only can see 25 people at a time. You know what we might do? Why don't I ask, how about if Josh Renniker, I think you're on the call, if you wouldn't mind giving us, since you're one of the presenters in a future series, if you wouldn't mind giving us some thoughts um, on how you uh, interface, you know, these, you know, early stage concepts in, you know, down into a, a, a tangible search effort. Sure, <clears throat> sure, I'm happy to share. Um, one of the things that, uh, that has come up here for me in the last uh, probably six or eight weeks, the thing that I've heard the most um, is, is around storytelling. And uh, the, more I, the more I network with people, uh, the more that, that idea of, hey, I'm interested to know a little bit more about you, tell me your story. You know, I, I don't ask the question of tell me a little bit about yourself. I like, I want to hear the narrative. I want to hear the excitement. I want to I want to see, I want to, I want to experience who you are. Um, and, and through the, the presentation, that slide that you guys had up there, I think, you know, really the, the three steps that you have there is people telling their story. Um, and, and, you know, I think we have, we have an opportunity through, specifically through LinkedIn uh, to do that. Um, you know, I think uh, for, for folks that are, that are in the weeds and, and in, the, in the midst of the search, uh, you know, I think that's a, that's a great time to, to put yourself out there a little bit. Uh, you know, post, post a little video 
about, hey, here's here's what I'm doing today. Here's what's going on. Here's here's you know here's here's what I'm looking for. Here's the value I can bring. You know, people people resonate with that, and people resonate with the being able to read the excitement. You know, how much do people resonate in the professional headshot that you have as your LinkedIn profile picture versus you doing a video telling your story or you getting on a Zoom and telling your story, right? And you see a, a lot more of the excitement and, and what you bring. Um, and uh, one of the things that, that you can do is through your network, uh, as you start poking around, uh, one of the things that we talk a lot about in the COO forum is the CEO COO relationship. Um, so I think if you if you spend a little time uh, and and research some CEOs that you align with, uh, and and start reaching out and start networking with some of those people because a lot of those a lot of those CEOs are relationship driven and they have a big network of other CEOs that are like minded. So you may have a conversation with somebody that's, that's a CEO, but, and not really looking for you, but he knows a guy that knows a guy. So, you know, I think there's a lot of value in just telling your story and, and finding some CEOs out there that align well and that you would pair well with, uh, because that may open up a door to that conversation with the guy that, that needs you. So that, that's, that's a little bit that I would throw in there. Thank you, Josh. That's really helpful. And to your point about video interviews, in our first session, Igor mentioned a company, Inter30. Igor, do you have a are they, do you still like them as a conceptual company, Igor? Have you had, you know, people have had success with them, or have you moved away from their their platform? No, no, still uh, with them. They're very active. They're a very small startup, but they came with a very innovative idea to uh, shrink down the story uh, to about 30, 40 seconds. So imagine um, you need to post your story to be hired on TikTok, multiply by two. It's really, really hard. I, I did try it three years ago, um, just as a fun. I could never get it under 40 seconds. So if you go on my LinkedIn, the story is still there. Uh, I could not get it down to 40 seconds. So I, I failed as an advertiser, um, but uh, it works. <laughs> If you can get it down to that level, you are a star. You'll you'll get hired on TikTok even. Great. Thank you, Igor. Um, so I, you know, it's we're getting to the end. I know Bill has some closing comments, but I did want to ask uh, Rich Haran, uh, who is the uh, uh, runs the Sacramento Sac Cities chapter for the COO Forum, if he had any other final thoughts before we turn it back over to Bill to close sure. the meeting. Sure, I do a couple. So the first one is, um, you know, you talked about frame of mind is transition is also an opportunity, right? It's a chance to charge, reconnect with your family, reflect, and maybe spend some time on doing some uh, personal development that you didn't have time to do in the past. So it doesn't seem that way, but, but if you make it, you know, the glass is half, half empty versus half full uh, as an opportunity. Uh, you talked a lot about personal branding, really, and personal branding is it's a marketing tool, right? What is it you're, you're selling yourself? So first, so two pieces to that one, it doesn't have to reflect your history of what you did. It should use historical information to project what you want to do. Right. And I see this so many times, like in your case, you don't spend all the time writing about the legal work you did or your CFO work. You talk about your COO work, your leadership. How do you change an organization? So again, your resume is a personal branding document of what I want to do. Um, and then the last thing I'll throw out is, um, you know, and Josh sort of talked about your story. The story's not about you. The story's about the person who's receiving it, right? So put yourself on their side of the table. You've all been there. You've all hired someone. So take a step back to what would I be looking for if I was that hiring manager and think about them. So that's the, probably the three things I'll throw out in the short amount of time. Rich, thank you. That was great. So with that, I think I will turn it back to Laura and Bill. Uh, for some closing thoughts before uh, we close out the meeting. Sure, um, I'll take it. Um, I'd like to thank both of you, Dan and Igor, for your willingness to take this on again. It was great back in September, and I just love all the added things. And I know it took a lot of time for you to put that together because I think Igor probably had to view most of those videos to be able to tell us because he didn't he didn't join all of them. And I really appreciate that because tying into all 
the previous sessions that we've run that 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 Josh and Mark and others that are on this call have led. Um, there's there's great resources there, and um, the ones that he highlighted are definitely worth going back to look at. But they're all very helpful in this whole process, and they do all tie together. Um, I'm going to share my screen just super quick, just to show you what we're up to in the next um, couple of weeks. As Bill mentioned, I'm going to go to the middle one. We're super excited that we have the president of Corn Ferry that's joining us. Bill's meeting with him this week to form that topic, but I hope you won't miss that. In addition to all the others, because in addition to what Igor and Dan put out today, which was fabulous, uh, we've got something on virtual networking um, next week, um, or actually on the 23rd. And then um, in March, we, we're going back to LinkedIn because that's always interesting and it'll have a different twist on it. And then um, we've got somebody coming in talking on mindset, um, which we touched on earlier in this in the whole series. So it's good to bring that back. But anyway, that's what we've got going on for you. Thank you so much for all showing up and good to see you and hope you enjoyed a nice long weekend and everybody stays warm and we'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you.